We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, we're really glad that you're here this morning. We're in the fourth week of our series going through origins of scripture. And I'm thinking, if we're going to be talking about the Tower of Babel and the beginning of diversity, where, where diversity comes from, even in this room, when you look around, you see people who look differently than you, talk differently than you, different skin tone than you, all the diversity that we experience, where does that come from in Scripture? I'm thinking, who would better uh, to share that than, than, than David? And here, David and I, we've met maybe three years ago, and uh, this past April, we had an opportunity to travel to India together. And uh, David is uh, one of our missions partners from Mission India. And so I thought uh, I got to invite him to come and communicate this. Now, I want to ask you to listen carefully and uh, be ready to listen a lot this morning because of his very thick Indian accent. But I think you'll be able to, to hear everything he's going to say. I believe that you can do it. And we're really excited about hearing what you're going to share with us this morning. Would you guys uh, let David know how we welcome guests? Good morning, Arundel Christian Church. <laughs> it's, you know it's not good for pastors to lie on a Sunday morning. Hey, it is good to be with you. This place is very familiar to me. I grew up in this area, middle school and high school. I attended school at Fairland, 4C, Paint Branch, and I attended school in Montrose, uh, Montrose Christian School in Rockville. So very familiar with the area, and I concur with Pastor Matt about the diversity uh, that is this, there in this area. It's a lot like heaven, what heaven's going to be like, uh, and we rejoice in that. Uh, as Pastor Matt mentioned, my name is David Chakra Narayan. I serve with an organization called Mission India, uh, and I'll be sharing about that a little bit later in my message. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank you for your incredible generosity that you have already shown uh, in supporting the work of reaching unreached people groups uh, in the land of India, and I'll highlight that a little bit later uh, in my message. Uh, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. My family couldn't come with me, so I'll show you a picture of them. My wife and I, Kristen, have been married for 19 years, and we have five daughters. Exactly. Please put me on your church prayer list. I have three teenage girls at home, and you can only imagine the kind of conversations that happen. Uh, so I'm grateful for them. I also have some of my family that lives here. They're in attendance as well. And I'm grateful uh, that they were able to come out. Uh, I'll show you a picture here. Pastor Matt and I, as he mentioned, we traveled to India together in April uh, with uh, church leaders from across the country. So it was an incredible trip uh, to see how God is working in that nation. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue in our series on Origins, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 11, The Beginning of Diversity. The question that we need to ask ourselves is this, is does the Bible explain for us and show us how we have a diversity of people groups, languages, and cultures all around the world? And the answer is yes. This morning, what I want to do is I want to make a connection between the Tower of Babel, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 17, and the work of Mission India and the gospel spreading out into all the world and how we can also be a part of that. So when we begin with Genesis, it's important for us to understand that the development of doctrine that we see throughout Scripture is rooted in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis gives us the history of the universe from the uh, mindset and from the perspective of the most reliable eyewitness in all of history. And who is that God? God has given to us his word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So Genesis is foundational book of Scripture. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we find the history of creation, the first man and woman. We find a world that is perfectly created by God, marred by sin through Adam's disobedience. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that there was someone by the name of Adam. He was a historical figure. If you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul says this, 
When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death to spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So no longer, because of Adam's disobedience, do we live in a perfect world. We live in a fallen world. Everywhere that we look around us, we see the consequences of the fall. And in the fall, our relationship with God, which once was perfect, is now severed. So now we have a situation, because of Adam's sin, and since we are uh, descendants of Adam and Eve, there is now an infinite gap that exists between God and man because of sin. But here's some good news that comes as a result of that, that even in this fallen state and even with a separation because of sin, God did not leave us hopeless, but he provides a way of salvation for us. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have the account of the fall, but then in that exact same chapter, in chapter 3, we have an account of the fact that God is going to provide hope for us. And we find this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In theological terms, this is known as proto-evangelium. It basically means first gospel. It is a promise that the Messiah will come and crush the serpent. The Messiah is going to be victorious, and those who trust in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will also be victorious. Church, I want to share with you something this morning. If you know Christ as your Savior, you don't have to wait for a victory. You are victorious right now. We get to celebrate in the finished work of the cross today. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to appeal to you, put your faith in Christ today, and He will save you, He will redeem you, and you are sealed for the day of redemption. So as we're studying the book of Genesis in the beginning, what we find starting in Genesis chapter 3 with sin is that we're also introduced to the seed. And we see these parallel themes on every page of the Old Testament. We have sacrifices, we have atonement over and over again through the Old Testament. It is basically offering for sin because humanity has fallen before God, but in that sacrifice we have a picture of what Jesus Christ would do on our behalf. So it is sin and seed. So prior to Genesis chapter 11, it is important for us to understand this concept of the fact that there is sin, but there is also seed that is promised, because prior to Genesis chapter 11, we find the account of the ark and the flood. Now think about this for a moment. The question is, uh, arises, what exactly went on Noah's ark? So you may say, Dave, that's pretty easy. Noah and his family, they went on the ark. The kinds of animals went on the ark. There's probably food supply that went for Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. What else went on the ark? It's important for us to remember that Noah is a descendant of Adam. So when Noah and his family entered the ark, guess what else entered? Sin. Sin entered into the ark. But not just sin, but there's something else that entered into the ark. It was the seed that was promised because according to Luke chapter, two, uh, Luke chapter 3, where we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, one of Noah's sons, Shem, is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So sin enters the ark, but also the promised seed in Genesis chapter 3. So that helps us understand the context leading up to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. So in your Bibles, we're going to look at the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 11, and this is what the Bible says. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used instead of mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. Now look at these next few words. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages that they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. 
This is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. Starting in Genesis chapter 11, from a foundational perspective, we can understand why we have different people groups, cultures, languages all over the world because of the historical events that happened in Genesis chapter 11. Now, what does Babel mean? Babel literally means to confuse. When Noah and his family had come off the ark, God had given a clear command. He said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But the people in Genesis chapter 11, the descendants of Noah, they had a different plan. By the way, I want to ask you a question this morning. How do you know if your plan is out of sync with God's will? Here's the answer. When it's all about me rather than all about God. Look at what they say, the phrase, they said, this will make us famous. It had all to do with their glory and not God's glory. You might be stuck in your spiritual life right now. You might be wondering why God is not answering your prayer. Perhaps the question you should be asking is, am I doing things so that I can get self-glory or so that I can give God glory? Church, I want to tell you right now, God will do whatever it takes to make sure that he is the only one that gets all the glory because he deserves all the praise. He alone is worthy. And if you stand in that way, God will humble you to the point where you will have to give him glory. Their intention was, this will make us famous. But what is the spirit of Babel? The spirit of Babel is confusion. This is rooted in disobedience. The people had a command to spread out all over the world, but instead they chose to disobey God. Here's what I want to tell you. In the spirit of Babel, in disobedience, in your life, you will be able to realize whether or not you're in God's will in the way that you are functioning and operating, whether it's in obedience or disobedience. It is the spirit of Babel. But there is also the spirit of the gospel because we find that the gospel brings clarity. The gospel brings clarity. I want you to think about this for a moment when you contrast the spirit of Babel and the spirit of the gospel in bringing clarity. Here it is. The world says to you, follow your heart. The gospel tells us that our hearts are deceitful. You know, you've had people say to you, or maybe in conversation, you know what, I just want to follow my heart. The problem is the way of following your heart will lead you to hell. The gospel brings clarity in that regard. The world says you can earn your way to heaven. The gospel tells us that no amount of good works will satisfy God's requirement of perfection. You must trust in the finished work of the cross. The spirit of Babel says, the world says you can live your own truth. The gospel tells us Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. The spirit of Babel brings confusion and disobedience. The spirit of the gospel brings clarity because I now recognize what God wants from me. And so when you think about these in Genesis and tying them to the New Testament, I want you to think about this for a moment. In Genesis chapter 3, when God drives out Adam and Eve, he expels them. He says, I want you to leave from this place because of disobedience. In the Tower of Babel, God comes down, he drives them away because they disobey God. But I want you to think about something else. In the New Covenant, when God drives his people out, it's for the purpose of making his gospel known to the ends of the earth. And that is what we find in Acts chapter 2. You are all very familiar with that story when people, when the tongues of fire come down and people start speaking in different languages and people are there from other countries and they recognize these people speaking their languages. It is God driving his people out so that they will hear his life-saving message. But I want to tell you that even with 2,000 years of church history, there are still people around the world who have yet to hear the saving message of the gospel. And because of that, we're going to be, in the rest of our time, focused on Acts chapter 17. And I want to focus more specifically on the land of India. On the land of India. The question that I want to ask you as I'm sharing this is this, is what role am I playing in advancing the gospel, not just locally, but also globally? Why does it matter? Because we as Christians, we truly believe that the Bible is the only true revelation from God to man. 
Over a period of 1,500 years, 40 different authors on three different continents are able to give us this collaboration that tells us that if you reject Jesus Christ and the offer of salvation, there are eternal consequences for rejecting him. So in Acts chapter 17, we see Paul's passion for Christ that caused him to be bold and engaged for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at just a few verses in Acts chapter 17. Let me set up the context very quickly. The Apostle Paul uh, is, finds himself in a place called Athens. He had been kicked out of a place called Thessalonica. A group of very pious Jews come and they stir up trouble. Then he finds himself in a place called Berea. Those same Jews from Thessalonica come to Berea. They stir up trouble. So Paul leaves Silas and Timothy right there. And he goes over into this place called Athens. Now, by the time the Apostle Paul arrives in Athens, in, in Greece, no longer is it the cultural center, it's the cultural center of Greece, it's not the political center of Greece. It is a place that is filled with a lot of influential philosophers, a lot of intelligent people that are discussing philosophy. So it could have been an intimidating environment for the Apostle Paul, but his confidence was not in himself and making himself famous. His confidence was in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when he comes into this place, he finds an opportunity to advance the name of Jesus. So look at Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. The Bible says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by the, all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. In the remainder of our time, I want to give you three gospel consistencies in Paul's life. Three gospel consistencies, and I pray that these are evident in our lives as well. Number one gospel consistency is this, Paul had compassion for the lost. Paul steps into Athens, he sees Greece, uh, and he steps into this city called Athens, and he sees nothing but people worshiping idols that they thought represented some type of power or some type of God. You know what Paul sees? Paul sees the lostness of humanity. Church, can I tell you in 2023, there is something that we need to understand, and here it is. Lost people will act like lost people, amen? Quit watching the craziness of television and social media and asking yourself, why are people behaving in such a crazy manner? They don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. How else would we expect them to act? It is the life-giving message of the gospel. It is human beings trying to struggle and find significance from their creator. And there is a symptom of a far greater problem in our culture, and that problem is rooted in sin. The Apostle Paul, the Bible says, when he steps into this place, he was deeply troubled by all the false worship. But you know what he wanted to do? He also wanted to take action. By the way, notice what he didn't do when he saw the craziness in the culture. He didn't go grab five or ten of his best Christian buddies and go into a corner and complain about the culture. You and I know about Christians that all they do is complain about the craziness around them, right? Paul saw this not as an obstacle. He saw it as an opportunity to make the name of Jesus known to those who didn't know him. And that's what I want for all of us is that when we see our culture, when we see our world, and we see all the things that are causing heartache, we see it not as an obstacle, but we see it as an opportunity to make Jesus Christ known. I want to ask you a question this morning. When was the last time you were heartbroken by what you saw around you? Did you lash out in anger or did you have compassion for the lost? Was your spirit stirred up that you truly wanted to do something for the name of Jesus? I want to show you a picture of India, and it is a very common sight that when people travel throughout the land of India, that there are people worshiping idols that have been set up in temples. Now, you might be sitting here looking at this this morning and saying, that is such a silly thing. I can't believe that people would spend their time, energy, money to go into a temple and worship these millions of different gods. That seems pretty counterproductive. But church, can I tell you that in the West, we also have our own set of idols? 
We have the idols of careers, sports, cars, money. We are chasing after the American dream, right? We think that if I simply get a nice house, a great job, two cars, I'm able to go to vacation all the time. I'll be completely satisfied. And yet we find out that even when we attain all of these material possessions, we are still empty. Why? Because the human heart was never meant to be satisfied apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what we are after. We are after God's dream of making the gospel known to a lost and dying world. Notice what else Paul didn't have to do. He didn't have to pray about sharing Christ. Well, what do I mean by that? It is clear in Scripture we are given a command to go out and make disciples of all nations. But you know what we as Christians have a tendency of doing is that we take God's commands and we turn them into suggestions. We say, you know what, I think that's actually for somebody else at my church, somebody else in my Bible study. Surely God is not talking to me. Absolutely, yes, he is. There's another thing that we shouldn't do, is if you start to engage with people in a conversation about Jesus, the Bible, salvation, and you're having a great discussion, don't pull out Pastor's, Pastor Matt's business card and say, you know what, those are really great questions, why don't you call Pastor Matt, because he can answer all those questions. It is true that Pastor Matt can answer questions about Jesus, salvation, the Bible, but do you realize that every single one of us in this room who knows Christ as their Savior is called to study the Word of God and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with this lost world? Every single one of us has this responsibility, and I want you to think about this. Where God has placed you is your mission field, and you are the missionary. Does that change how you see what you do on a day-to-day basis? So no longer is it that I just show up at work and I do my job. No, that's your mission field. No longer do I just go to school, but that's my mission field. No longer do I go to a grocery store or ball games with my kids. That is my mission field. And God has placed me there not just to do work, not just to do school, not just to do activities, but that I would make the name of Jesus Christ known. There's something else that I've noticed about us as Christians is that we have a tendency of saying a very spiritual prayer. This is what the prayer goes like. And we especially say this prayer when it gets crazy in our world. Would you agree the last three years have been pretty crazy in the world? And then when we start to see, you know, disunity or we see, you know, calamity, here's the prayer. This is what it goes like. Jesus, please come back quickly. And and part of that prayer is pretty sincere because we truly do, as believers, desire to be united with the Lord. But part of it is also that we want to escape all the problems of this world. Church, here's the only problem. I do desire that Jesus would come back quickly, but here's the only problem. If Jesus Christ were to come back right now, you and I have friends and family who would be in a lot of trouble. So until Jesus comes back, as long as he is patient with us, As long as he tarries, don't waste time. Get out there and tell people about Jesus Christ because time is running out. We, you and I, we don't have an option about that. Not only did Paul have compassion for the lost, he communicated the truth. I realize in 2023, the word truth is very controversial. Church, there's only one truth and that's the word of God found in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24, he says this, He is the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Earlier I showed you a picture of people worshiping idols in the temple, but take a look at this next picture. These are people that are working in a small factory, manufacturing these idols that will eventually end up in temples that people will worship. Here's what Paul is saying. God is the creator of the universe. He is creator. He is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything from us. Have you ever tried to bribe God? It usually goes in the form of a very spiritual prayer. You know, you find yourself in a mess, maybe it's self-inflicted, something's happened to you, and you say a really spiritual prayer like this, Lord, if you would just get me out of this mess, 
I promise that I'll start coming to church regularly, read my Bible every day, and serve you faithfully. And we start to negotiate with God, and we try to bribe God with all these things that we can do. Here's the problem. How do you bribe and negotiate with someone who already owns everything? You and I don't come to God on our terms. We come to him on his terms. What does he desire? What does he want? And I submit myself to his will. Look at verse 26. Paul continues, he says, From one man he created all the nations throughout the world, the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him though he is not from any one of us. Let me show, show you quickly two of the prominent beliefs in India at the moment. You know, a lot of Hindus, they believe in this idea of reincarnation. Here's what it means. It basically means the life that you are living right now is either a reward or consequence of something you did in a previous life. So think about the ramifications of that worldview. If you are a woman, that, and I've had conversation with Hindus about this, if you are a woman that is caught up in being trafficked and abused, that is your consequence for something you did in a previous life. If you're an orphan on the streets of India and you're begging for money and you have no hope, that is your consequence for something you did in a previous life. So you have to try to be the best person that you can die, be born into something better, and you have to go through multiple cycles until you achieve perfection. Years ago, I visited Thailand, went to a holy site, and you have to take this pilgrimage up these set of stairs, right? And the funny thing is, as you're walking up these stairs, there's like food vendors. Now imagine this for a second, it's the equivalent of you walking on a treadmill eating a cupcake. It's not going to do anything for you, right? So you, gotta, you have to walk up all of these stairs, and then when you get to the top, there's a temple area, there's all of these idols, and they're overlooking the city. To me, it is a perfect picture of what religion is. Religion says, you try to be a good person, you try to do good works, you make the effort, and perhaps God will have mercy on you. You know what Christianity says? Christianity says that there is an infinite gap between God and man, and it can only take the perfect sacrifice of God himself as the substitutionary atonement for my sin to bridge the gap between God and man. And that is what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. There's also something called the caste system in India. Here's what it is. It is a societal order built on religious and cultural norms in which the population of a state is divided into a hierarchy of classes. The members of the different levels of the system have different degrees of purity or worthiness and therefore have different rights. You may not find this necessarily in the big cities, but as you go out rural, you will find people that are separated based on caste. Some people are considered worthy, some people are considered important, and the benefits that you have are based on that caste. Do you know what the gospel says about this? Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29. There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. There is a group of people in India at the very bottom that are called the untouchables. You don't want to associate with those kinds of people if you live in that land. But the gospel message says that even though the culture says you're dirty, you're unworthy, you're an untouchable, when you trust Christ as your Savior, you are invited to the feast at the king's table. That is significant value and worth that is given only because of the gospel. We find out about God in these passages that he is global in his reach. He is global in his reach. Look again at verse 26. He says, from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole world. What does that mean? It means that since we all come from Adam and Eve, do you know how many different races there are? There is only one race, the human race. But we have different people, groups, and cultures that are spread out all around the world. And since we all died in Adam, the gospel is for every human being. We all have an obligation to share the gospel locally and globally. Think about the significance of the fact that we all come from Adam and Eve. Here's what it means. When you see those crazy people on television or social media losing their minds, remember this, they are your relatives in Adam. 
But for the grace of God, you and I would be doing those exact same things. Thank God that he saved you out of that sinful life, gave you his spirit, so now you can be obedient to his will. I want to show you a few maps here. Does anybody recognize this next map? This is a map of the Glen Burnie area. Now, when you see those red markers, I know this is a church community. Those are not Chick-fil-A locations, okay? <laughs> what those actually are churches in this area, within a 5 to 15 minute drive of this church, you can access a church where you can enter in to the church building, hear about Jesus, hear the gospel, and be on your way to heaven. There's also other churches in the community that are doing outreach into the community. There's churches everywhere. There's churches all throughout America, even in the smallest towns. But then I want you to look at a compare contrast with this next map. This is a map that was put out by the International Mission Board that studies uh, the evangelical world uh, in terms of where there's growth or there isn't growth. If you see green markers on that map, it means that there is 10% or higher evangelical presence within that nation. It means that there are a lot of resources in that country where people are able to hear the name of Jesus. But if you look at, also look at that map, you'll notice that there is also a lot of red dots. And you'll see one particular nation that is very red. Red on that map represents 2% or less evangelical presence in that nation. India is the most unreached nation in the world. There are more people groups in India who are considered unreached than anywhere else in the world. It has a population of 1.45 billion. It passed up China earlier this year. It is considered that there's around four to 500 million people that are considered unreached. What do I mean by unreached? Here's what I mean. They have never heard the name of Jesus. They don't know a Christian. They have no access to a Bible, and there is no church in the community. And there's billions of people also globally that are considered unreached. You may say, okay, Dave, what's the big deal? Fine, they're unreached, they don't hear the gospel. How does it apply to me? Look again at verse 26, the second part. It says about God, he decided beforehand when they should rise and fall and he determined their boundaries. Basically, it means that God was providential in terms of where he would place people. So here's my question for you this morning. How many of you had a choice where you would be born? Raise your hand. I noticed no hands went up. Do you realize you could have been born in a place called Afghanistan? In 2021, when the United States was pulling out of Afghanistan, we all saw the images on television where people were jumping on the airplanes that somehow they could escape from that land because there was absolutely no hope. Did that break our hearts? We look at things that are happening in Israel and West Bank and Gaza. We hear about children that are dying. We hear about people that are dying. Does it break our hearts? We read about the people that are considered unreached all around the world. Here's what I want you to understand. Whether it's Afghanistan, Israel, West Bank, Gaza, the unreached, that could have been your family and my family. But for some reason in God's design and providence, he made sure that he placed us here where we could hear about Jesus, grow in our walk with God, and be on our way to heaven. Church, it had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with God's grace in our lives. Let us be grateful for the incredible opportunity that God has granted to us. I want you to look at this next map. It is a map that is put out by an organization called Open Doors. They partner with the persecuted church around the world. Many of you might be familiar even with something called Voice of the Martyrs. You notice there, if you notice red, it stands for extreme persecution in that land. India is ranked number 11 in the world in terms of nations that persecutes Christians the most. If you also look at that map, you'll see the highlighted section. It also is the places around the world that have the most unreached people groups globally. So these are the areas of the world that are the most persecuted. These are the areas of the world where people have yet to hear the name of Jesus, but there's a silver lining, there is some good news. And you might say to me, after all that, how can there be possibly any kind of good news? Here's the good news. These areas of the world that have extreme persecution are also where the church is growing the fastest. 
Do you know what that means? Here, here's the application for all of us. Either you want to be comfortable or you want to see God's kingdom grow around you, but you cannot have both at the same time when you're serving the Lord. If you want to see God do an incredible work in and through your life, you've got to step outside of your comfort zone and share Jesus with those who are lost and dying all around you. Will you do it and proclaim his name? Paul had compassion for the lost. Paul communicated the truth. My last point is this. Why does he do this? He warned them of a coming judgment. Look at verse 30. It says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. A couple of things that Paul says here is this. Humanity is guilty before God. There is no one innocent. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But he also says that humanity is going to have to give an account. Do you realize you will have to stand before God one day and give an account as to how you lived? God sees everything. God knows everything that you're doing, whether you're in public or private. You will have to give an account of how you lived to a just and holy God. Why do I know this? Paul says this because he has proven this by raising Christ from the dead. We, this is going to happen because the resurrection is real. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the earliest letters that was circulated among the churches that is a defense for the resurrection, you know, Paul talks about the eyewitnesses, the people that saw him, and he basically says, I know the resurrection is real, but here also is something that Paul says. He says, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we are the most pitiful of people. Imagine showing up on a Sunday morning, worshiping, giving, reading from God's word, and yet we serve a dead Savior. How pitiful would that be? But here is the testimony that we have from the word of God, and here it is, is that Jesus did come to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He healed the lame. He made the blind to see. He calmed the storms. He fed thousands. He confronted the Pharisees. He offers grace to sinners. He was betrayed, beaten, rejected, and killed. He died a substitutionary death on the cross for our sins. The wrath of God was poured out on him. He was buried, but the third day he rose again. He defeated the power of death and the grave. He ascended into heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And the Bible says one day... He promises to return, and when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You will have no other option when you see him but to bow down to him and say to him, my Lord and my God. We started out talking about the Tower of Babel, about God spreading out people groups, languages, and cultures all around the world. We see the the gospel spreading out even in our world today. But there's a day of rejoicing coming and that's found in Revelation chapter seven, verses nine and 10. The apostle John gives this incredible image to us of what he sees in heaven. Look at this. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Do you look forward to that day? I'm telling you right now, when you and I, when you and I step into heaven one day and we see people groups, languages, cultures worshiping before the throne and we see the millions and millions of people, we are going to be overwhelmed by the sight. But one thing you cannot forget is that when you step into eternity and see these things, remind yourself, it was Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for my sin. It is he that was risen from the dead and it's only because of his grace that I get to see such an awesome sight and be in his presence forever. But until that day comes, stop wasting time. Let's get engaged in sharing the good news of the gospel with a world that is lost and dying. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time.
Lord, I thank you for your word that gives us the proper history and context of the world. Lord, I thank you for this incredible hope that we have that even though we fell in Adam, in Christ we have been lifted up. In Christ we have been forgiven. In Christ we have been seated in heavenly places. In Christ we have been sealed until the day of redemption. Father, I pray that for every single person in this room, Lord, if they don't know you as their Savior, that they would commit today because they will have to stand and give an account. And Lord, for those of us that do know you as our Savior, I pray that we would be bold and courageous in sharing the good news with lost people all around us. Lord, I thank you for this vision that you have given to us, not just locally, but also globally. And Father, remind us that the same grace that saved us is available to those around us. Father, use this church, Arundel Christian Church, to proclaim your gospel to the nations. We thank you and we love you. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.